Hi, I'm Brent Stafford and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. There are very few regulations that anger so many Canadians than those that deal with alcohol. The politics around liquor regulation is at times a nasty brew of taxation, protectionism and good old-fashioned moralization. Joining us today to discuss the state of play in BC's liquor laws is Bill Thielman, a communications and strategy consultant for his firm Weststar Communications. He is one of BC's top political columnists and a former communications director to the BC Premier when the NDP held the reins of power in the 1990s. Bill, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So first off, tell us, what is the state of play? Why is BC liquor laws so maddening? Well, first of all, everything's moving. The whole backfield is in motion. So we've had a lot of liquor laws that were antiquated, and I give the Liberals credit, BC Liberals credit, for changing some of those. Um, other things, however, are going in the wrong direction, and we're seeing a lot of higher prices. We already have probably the highest prices, or among the very highest prices in North America, not just in Canada. And then we've seen another of other changes that are just not clear. Like we watched as the price changed literally before our eyes in the liquor store on April 1st, because they went from a price that had taxes added and included in it to a price without taxes. And you find out at the store clerk what, how much the tax is. So they went to what's called a single wholesale price. And that's hidden a lot of other things and it's created a lot of problems we haven't seen the end of yet. So it seems to me that regulation when it comes to alcohol here in British Columbia, the government really has their hand in it. And in other areas of regulation, they're, not, they're a little bit more back, you know, back seat, a little more arm's length. Why have they got so much interference? Well, first of all, we're going right back to the basically prohibition days of the United States. That liquor is always seen as a sin, as a sin tax, as a sin thing. And so there's a lot of regulation around that. Part of it is still a hangover from those days, pardon the pun. So this is a large market. BC's Liquor Board is one of the largest wine, beer and spirits buyers in the world. Now that's amazing, I've heard that before. Give us some scope on that. I mean, why is it so big? Are, do British Columbians just like to drink more? Well, we have a mixed system. So we have government and private stores, and that's happened over time in the last 25, 30 years. But the government buys and distributes all the wine, all the beer, all the spirits. So they put a markup on everything, and then there's taxes on top of that. They make almost a billion dollars a year in pure revenue, profit. And that's all from liquor. Are British Columbians going to benefit from having beer and wine available in grocery stores? Well, as I recently wrote, we're going to see actually probably less choices and higher prices as we see supermarkets taking over. And if we look at every other market in the world, Australia, for example, 65 to 70 percent of the wine market is controlled by two supermarkets. So you can imagine it, we're, we're going into oligopoly territory from a very diverse system. And there's really no way the price is going to go down. That's part one. Part two, the BC government in their modernization, as they call it, laws, has said we're only going to have BC wines in these supermarkets. Well, already Chile, California, New Zealand have written letters to the government saying, uh-uh, this isn't right, we have trade deals. And there's international trade agreements. You can't say, well, we're just not going to allow your product to be sold in, in some locations. So but certainly the BC Liberals would have known about this. They must be picking a they, fight. They, 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 they know that they're going to lose. In my cynical view, they know they're going to lose this one. The BC wineries are starting to wake up, particularly the small ones, because you know, Brent, what will happen. Everybody probably knows if you're going to go buy wine, Yellowtail, the biggest wine probably in the world from Australia, they're going to come into your local supermarket and say, we'd like most of your shelf space. And we're going to sell you this product way lower than anything else from BC. We're going to put ads in the paper. We're going to mention your supermarket. We're going to do all this promo. We'll have trip, prizes, everything. Uh, but we don't want to see a lot of BC wines on the shelf and they're going to squeeze those guys out, and that's what's happened everywhere around the world. Yeah, in Ontario, uh, they're just finalizing and moving forward on the beer going into their grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, think, I, mean, I think it's probably an inevitability in the long run, and, and certainly there's no way BC's going to keep out other producers. There's just no way that's going to happen. So, but I, the concern that I have is I think people are given, being given a snow job if they think they're going to find, it, oh, it's, it's going to be like Safeway in the United States or something where you can go in and buy some cheap wine. No, it won't be cheaper, it'll be more expensive, there'll be less choices, and you'll be sorry in the end of this process, but no one's telling you that, except me. <laughs> well, and you've been pretty loud about it too, which is good. And people, let me ask you that. How has the response been from the people who've been reading your columns? Um, are they getting it that, that they're getting bamboozled or? Oh yeah, Pe people know that they're being hosed on booze prices in every way, whether it's in a bar where the happy hour price went up, whether it's in, uh, you know, when they hear about corner stores, they're thinking, oh, that'll be convenient. And then they, oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna pay more. And you know, the best way I could actually show you how you're being bamboozled, Brent, is to grab this bottle of wine from over here. This is one I wrote about recently, Behringer Knights Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. I was down in San Francisco. I went to the corner store, nondescript, $17.99. That's about $24.06 Canadian. 
This bottle of wine, regular price in BC, $49.44. Wow. Over double the price. BC government didn't grow the grapes, they didn't fertilize them, they didn't pick them, they didn't vent them, they didn't cork the bottles, they didn't make the labels, they didn't do anything except take it from California, put it on the shelf and sell it. That's double the price. Is it fair to say, knowing you and, and knowing your writing, is it fair to say that you're a little left to center? Oh yeah, absolutely. Are not the high prices then the price we have to pay as British Columbians for good health care and education and all of the other things the government pays for on our behalf? Well, taxes certainly have to cover that, there's no question, but we know that there's countries all around the world, that Scandinavia and Western Europe, who don't have anywhere near the prices we pay and they seem to have a good economy and better uh, health care and education in many ways than we do. So that's one way to do it. We're still, it's going back to the basically the prohibition sin tax sort of period. We're saying, oh, you're an evil wine drinker. You must pay for your sins by paying too much for your wine. And I don't agree with that. I think any reasonable tax system should be based on progressive income tax and not on consumer goods where uh, if you're rich, it doesn't matter what the sales tax is. But if you're less than rich, it makes a big difference. The BCGEU. Uh, they're the union that has obviously the workers that are in the stores. Do, do you get any pushback from them? Because obviously they get union prices. I know that some cynical people in British Columbia will say, well, yeah, but that's because, you know, so much money is going to pay to those union workers mm -hmm. uh, that we're forced to have at the government stores. Um, is there some truth to that? And, and is there ever some pushback? Well, certainly, in fact, the interesting thing, Brent, is that some of the government employees union reps have said, oh, you know, you're scaring people when you say, Bill Thielman, you're, that the government liquor store is going to close. But I believe that that's a real serious threat, and I think they're concerned about that. But realistically, yes, they get paid a premium. They, they get paid more than a lower-end uh, cold beer and wine store employee. They have a pension, those sort of things. Does that make a double difference in prices on something like this or a significant difference like that? No, it doesn't. When the BCGU contract expires in a year or so, I think the government employees are going to have a real tough time because they're going to start looking around and the government's going to say, look, you know, we don't need you as much as you think you do. And we're going to start moving, you know, they've already moved so that there's actually more private stores than public, but the public stores do more business. So we're going to see what happens there. But I think the BCGEU has to be quite concerned about what's going to happen down the road. And I know that its employees, I talk to a lot of them. I'm a wine guy. I'm a wine collector. I, I go and shop in all sorts of stores, private and public, talk to people. And the government employees are very nervous. Seems to me this is actually probably going to put the government in a good negotiating position, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean the supermarket piece and of course the BCGU doesn't represent anyone in supermarkets. Now the BCGU and the Private Liquor Store Association got together a couple of weeks ago <laughs> and jointly announced if marijuana... When? Get, when, <laughs> when marijuana uh, gets uh, sold recreationally here in Canada, that in BC they wanted to be the ones to handle it. What did you think of that and, and why is that happening? Well, firstly, it was shocking because the government liquor store folks and the government union uh, and private stores have always been at loggerheads and they have different interests. So I think that really indicates to us that they are in serious trouble on both sides and they both sides know it. So I think that was the first observation I made. Secondly, I, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I don't think it's a bad idea at all to say, okay, we've got people who are already regulated. They have to be uh, trained and they have to have certain standards for selling liquor whether it's private or public, why not just add that to the marijuana to that and say, okay, you know, we've got the system that works here. But, it, you know, it's obviously self-serving, but it also actually could serve a good purpose. What does the future look like? I think the future looks like higher prices, fewer choices. If, as we've seen everywhere else in the world, 65 to 70 percent of the market's going to get controlled by a few supermarkets, the government liquor store stuff, all of that is gone. They're going to be decimated. The private stores will be decimated. Uh, we'll see basically very few private or government liquor stores at all, and we'll be all supermarkets. <laughs>